Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. I finished the mechanical and electrical work to put my HF receiver into this larger case and it passed the power on self test. Let's check out the progress. Before I cut a bunch of holes in the new chassis, I first want to salvage what I'm going to save from the old one. So here's a condensed version of the teardown. Alright, here's the main board with the audio daughter board and several of the controls still attached to it. On the flip side we can see the SI5351 oscillator and the MAX4820 multiplexer mini boards. I'll save the old display. I've got a couple of future project ideas where I might reuse it. Moving on, it's time to start work on the new chassis, beginning with the front and rear panels. Now because these already have a nice finish on them, I'm covering both of them inside and out with masking tape to reduce the chances of scratching them while I'm drilling all these holes. I've printed the hole patterns at 1 to 1 scale, so it's just a simple matter of taping them to the panels and using a center punch to mark all the hole locations. For the rectangular cutouts, I'm using a snap blade knife and a straight edge to score the hole outlines. I start each line at a corner and then score just over halfway down its length. Now that way I don't accidentally overshoot the end of the line. Now the score does not need to be that deep, it's just a visual reference for me to follow with the hand nibbler. Once everything's marked, I can remove the templates. I don't need them anymore. And speaking of nibbling, yep, I'm using an old school hand nibbler. It works okay on this aluminum material, it's just slow and fatiguing. But it is more controllable than a reciprocating saw, and it's still faster than a hacksaw. I don't need super straight cuts because the edges, well, they're going to be hidden anyway. Here's the back panel with all of its various size holes completed. And here's the speaker grill. I picked up several of these at a ham fest. I have no idea what these were originally intended to be used for, but for me, <laughs> it's a speaker grill. I'm using aluminum rivets in all but two of the holes to secure it to the panel. I can use rivets here because I don't need to make it removable. Plus, the flat heads on the rivets give it a nice clean look. And since I've got some hammering to do, it's time for a reapplication of protective tape. Plus, the tape keeps the rivets in place while I'm swaging them. Here they are after swaging. These washers help spread the clamping force load. I did not use rivets in the middle holes on either side. Now that's where I'm going to use screws to hold the speaker mounting bracket in place. And speaking of the speaker mounting bracket, <laughs> it needs some captive nuts stuffed in it. There are six of them, two number fours and four number eights. The two screws holding the speaker mounting bracket to the back panel use the number four nuts, and the four screws holding the speaker to the speaker mounting bracket use the number eight nuts. <laughs> you got all that? Let me demonstrate. Here's the speaker mounting bracket attached to the back panel using two number four screws engaging the two captive number four nuts. Okay, and here's the speaker being attached to the speaker mounting bracket using four number eight screws engaging the four captive number eight nuts. Ta-da! The back panel is now complete. I did skip over attaching the four connectors, but there's not much to talk about there. On the front panel, however, I do need to talk a moment about how I'm attaching the display. I really don't want visible fasteners on the front panels of my projects, so I came up with this method for my HF transmitter project, and I'm repeating it here. It's easier to show it in CAD. I tried videoing the parts and the assembly process, but the important features are just too small to see on the camera. So let's start with the front panel. Nothing fancy, just a big rectangular opening. This part here is the bezel. It fits tightly in the opening in the front panel and it overlaps the cut edges slightly so you can't see them. Note these four shallow notches on the sidewalls of the bezel. Those provide undercut features that are captured by corresponding tabs on these two retainer bars, these two green parts. The retainer bars also have sockets in them that will capture number three nuts. And then finally, the display attaches to the retainer bars using number three screws, which fit through the holes provided on the display tabs. So tightening the screws clamps this whole bezel, retaining bar, and display sandwich together. And the gap between the retaining bars and the flange on the bezel is just slightly larger than the panel thickness so that nothing rattles. 
I also don't want holes in my front panel for the anti-turn posts on the controls. So I designed and 3D printed these thin adapters. There's one for the left side pair of controls and another for the right side pair. Each adapter has a small pocket that the anti-turn pin fits into. The control cannot spin relative to the adapter, and the adapter can't spin relative to the front panel because it's locked to the center axis of the other control. I think my ideas turned out really neat. Maybe not while E. Coyote super genius neat, <laughs> but it sure lets me avoid having any ugly fasteners and holes on the front panel. All right, home stretch now on the fabrication work. I need a bunch of holes drilled in the bottom half of the chassis. So I used a spare blank main board as a template. No big deal. Next comes the foldable foot. I machined a couple of brass axles for it to rotate on, plus I machined a little brass detent plunger. The plunger will ride on a detent profile on the side of the fixed foot. Next comes a spring salvaged from a ballpoint pen that will provide the detent force. And then finally a small pin to hold the detent spring in place. This is what the foldable foot looks like after assembly. I do need to file that pin flush, it's sticking out a bit too far. But most importantly, the foldable foot is working great. The detent mechanism provides just enough resistive force to keep the folding foot in both the stowed and deployed positions. And finally, the new front end attenuator. It was a quick and easy fab with just one tiny little mistake. Unfortunately, I didn't notice until after I had built it that my junk box relay is actually a single pole double throw. And that just plain won't work. I did have this Aromat double pull double throw signal relay, but <laughs> naturally it has a different footprint. So I had to redesign the layout, etch a new board, and populate it. <laughs> Lesson learned, always check your junk box parts carefully before using them. The good news is the attenuator works exactly as intended. I checked it on my Nano VNA and here's the results. In the through mode, there's negligible insertion loss, and in the attenuation mode, it's basically spot on for 10 dB loss. And with that completed, I now have all the parts ready to start putting this receiver together. It's time to start the electrical wiring. Now, I have updated the diagram for this receiver to show the connections to the new display and all the other changes. It is fairly complex. There's a fair number of point-to-point -point connections that need to take place. As far as materials go, I've got spools of new solid core 22 and 24 gauge in various colors, and I do use these quite frequently uh, on my projects. Uh, for here, I also have some scrap pieces of multi-conductor cable that I've salvaged for the conductors. I'll strip the jacket off and use the conductors, and I like using these because they give me additional color combinations that I don't have in the new wires, and I even have some striped color combinations, so that helps me maintain you know, a unique color coding for each of the connections. As far as building the harness goes, I got several options. One is I could just do point-to-point -point individual connections like I did on my Johnson Adventure restoration a couple years ago, and that would certainly be the fastest, and it worked just fine on the Adventure, mostly because there weren't that many connections, but here there's quite a few more, few more connections and doing that way would create a real rat's nest and make future troubleshooting difficult. So I'm not gonna go that way. Another approach that I considered was building the harness completely outside of the chassis on a nail board like I did on my Heathkit DX60 restoration. Now that would let me lace it up really neatly and let me uh, have access for lacing very easily and it would yield you know, a very tidy harness. However, <laughs> I don't have a dimensional template to work with here. For the DX60, I had the old harness to use that I could just copy. Plus, there were some dimensions in the manual that gave me a lot of good guidance on how long to make everything and get everything to break out at the right spot. I'd have to spend a lot of time up front to do that here. That would take quite a few hours to do. Plus, there's no guarantee that I would get it right in the end and might end up having to rework it. So instead, what I've decided to do is use the same approach that I used on my HF transmitter, meaning place all of the parts in the chassis like I've done here, take the panels and have them all populated, but lay them flat where they need to be. So the front panel here, back panel in the back, and then start with the longest wires first and route them in place where I want them, you know, bend them really neatly how I want the routing to go, and then progressively add the next longer wires and the, you know, the next longer wires and so on and go through to the shortest wires following that same path wherever possible. 
I also built in some slack so that I can always lay the front panel and back panels down like this for service or modification in, in the future. And as I'm going, I'll use some temporary ties, you know, kind of, you know, old bread ties or just scrap lengths of wire to temporarily hold that growing bundle together. And then when I'm done, I'll either use some of that spiral loom uh, that I'm showing the back here, or um, maybe I'll lace it depending on how much access that I have. I'm not optimistic I'll be able to lace this one because of access, but we'll see. I think this is one that's going to be, we'll see how it goes, and I'll make a decision as I get towards the end with all the wires in place. This is where I am after about three to four hours of work. And if there are any 5S gurus watching, you're probably going a little bonkers right now looking at this mess. But that's just the nature of working on a project like, like this. It's a mix of electrical and mechanical, and you need so many bits and pieces and, and so many tools. You just lay them out in a way that just works logically for you. And this works great for me when I'm doing a project like this. Now, it may not look like I've accomplished much in that time. Um, some of the time I did spend just thinking about how to route and secure the wires for the display. There's no you know, immediately obvious, elegant way to do this, mostly because I want this to be able to, to lay down like this if I ever need to work on it. But then when I fold it back up, it has to you know, neatly you know, uh, kind of collapse in this space right here. So doing it with a length of jacketed cable or putting a longer piece of spiral loom on there just wasn't going to work. It was going to be too stiff and it was not going to fold neatly. So this, I think, is just going to work fine within the space that's available. Um, another change that I've made here is I did revise the bracket that's holding the communication board. You know, originally I had this guy here and it was uh, positioned vertically, but I realized right away a little oversight. <laughs> I've got these two jumpers here that I need to access whenever I want to program the Nano. And getting into the space between the sidewall of the bottom half of the chassis and the board, it was just going to be too tight. So I changed this to put the board in horizontal. Whipped up a quick design, uh, 3D printed it. Uh, we can't see the actual part right now because it's hidden behind the board, but I'll put on screen for a few seconds the 3D model and kind of spin it around. You can see there's really not that much to it. I've also got the front end attenuator, um, the relay board for the front end attenuator mounted using a little piece of that hook and loop fastener. This stuff is you know, pretty, pretty strong grip. Uh, for being a Velcro type material. And this is really light, so it doesn't need anything stronger than that. It worked out fine, like I said earlier, on my DX60 project, so I just repeated it here as well. I've also started routing some of the connections around the perimeter of the main board. I'm using more of these plastic um, cable clamps, and these are working very nicely, just doing each wire individually one at a time. When I get them all in place, I'm probably just going to use a few wire ties to bundle it up and make it neat and tidy. I don't think I'm going to have room you know, to put in more of the spiral loom. And certainly at this point, I've given up on any thought of lacing it. There just isn't access to be able to get in there. And because I've got the display fully wired now, I whipped up a prototype program to test it out. And good news, it is working. Let's take a quick look at it. Ta-da! So that's not the final version of my graphics. Uh, I'm still working on the button design for the touch screen, but it's pretty close for the frequency display and a few other things. So it's good to know at this point that I did wire it correctly and it's working. A couple of evenings later and I'm done with the wiring and I ended up using a little bit of everything in here. Some split loom for the connections for the speaker. Uh, I braided the wires here for the IF bandwidth pot put some lacing on the short run of wires from the frequency pot down to the main board, and then a few wire ties here and there just to neaten things up. So overall, I'm really happy with how this turned out, even though it looks a little crowded again now. You know, the speaker gobbled up a fair amount of space, and putting these boards in like I did gobbled up some space, but still, there's a lot more clearance around everything than there was in the old case. So if I need to work on this, or modify it again in the future, I've definitely got an easier time of it than I did with the old case. Now, one small oversight, um, I didn't realize that the jack that I have here for the external speaker and headphones doesn't have a little disconnect switch in it. So I'm gonna need to find one of those online. I don't have one in my junk box. So for now, just got the speaker directly wired. But up next at this point, because the display is still working and it's powered off of 12 volts right now, next up will be the software. 
software. Yeah, I still have my fingers crossed that I'm going to be able to fit all the changes into the Nano's memory. 32K is a little tight and I haven't had to switch it out yet to the Nano Every and I'm hoping I can avoid having to do that hardware change at this point. So we'll see how it goes in the next and I'm going to hesitate to call it the final episode because this is one of those projects where I just find things to modify and change over time which is probably not that much different from the stuff that you guys work on as well. I do hope you've enjoyed the progress I've made on modifying this receiver to put it into a larger case. And as always, I hope you're enjoying the content here on my channel. So until next time, bye for now.